Hello, hello, this is Fear Dragon, and welcome to Breaking Out, the show about North American StarCraft 2 players. Here on this show, we take a look at an up-and-coming North American talent. Each week, we check out a new player to get a feel for their personality and their playstyle. On Thursday, we interview the player to find out more about who they are and why you should care about them. On Friday, we watch three of their games as we cover their playstyle in each of the three matchups. Saturday, we take a look at an awesome game they've played and relax with a little bit of fun as we recap the week and get an analysis of the games. Breaking Out will cover 8 players before it culminates into the Breakout Invitational. With a minimum prize pool of $1,000, we find out who is the most likely player to break out of the North American scene. But enough of that. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. Hope you guys enjoy the show. Hi guys, um, my account name is Naya. I'm 18 years old and I'm played Protoss. Um, what do I do for a living? I I'm currently taking a year off school and just playing StarCraft right now. Um, tell us the most interesting fact about yourself that you can think of. Um, when I was 14, I played Warcraft and I hit rank 1 on the Grandmasters. Or, well, not Grandmasters, but just the latter. Um, describe your play style for us. So, I don't really have a specific play style. I just play either very aggressive, passive, or I can mix it. I just like to mix it in in general. Um, one game I could all in. The next game I could play a completely standard macro game. Um, why do you deserve the chance to be the next breakout player? So, the reason I think I deserve the chance to be the next breakout player is just because I constantly work really hard at my games and I play lots of StarCraft and I think that I am at a level where I'm good enough to compete with some of the best players in North America so that's why I think I deserve the chance and what does StarCraft mean to me? Um, StarCraft means a lot to me but you know there's other things in life like school and girlfriend but yeah, lots of my time is on StarCraft, and I do take it quite seriously. Hello, hello, welcome to Breaking Out the Show by North American StarCraft 2 players that you need to know about. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a North American player who has earned the highest spot of the players applying to Breaking Out on the ladder. Please give a warm welcome to the 18-year-old Protoss player, John Naya Lugasakos. How are you doing today, man? And did I pronounce your last name at all correctly? Lagi Sakos. Okay. All right. Well, how are you doing today, Matt? I will. I guess you said good, but uh, really quickly, I did actually uh, want to just introduce the uh, show to anyone who's tuning in for the first time. Breaking out a show about North American StarCraft II players that are worth knowing about. The, each week, we spend one week highlighting an up-and-coming player in the North American scene and getting a feel for their play style, their personality, etc. And at the very end, it accumulates into the Breakout Invitational, where we actually have a, a big eight-man invitational tournament for those eight players. But uh, today is actually going to be the interview day. That's Thursdays. Uh, and tomorrow we're going to be looking at a bunch of the games from the player. And Sunday we look at an awesome game. We sit down, have a little bit of fun in like an arcade game. And we also get a bit of analysis in uh, replays from the actual player themselves. Get some actual thoughts and learn a little bit about StarCraft. But again, it's going to be the interview day. So... Naya, I have to ask, man, are you ready for the interview? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and do it then. So I, I want to start a little bit with your history because in your application video, right off the bat, you kind of said something very interesting, which was uh, that it sounds like you got sort of your involvement in esports, uh, or your initial involvement in esports off of Warcraft 3, when you said you were hitting like number one on the ladder um, at the age of like 14 years old. So can you tell us more about that? Uh, yeah, I played Orc. Warcraft, and I guess like when I hit rank 1 it was kind of not very competitive it was in like 2008 or 2009 mm -hmm. so like it was still pretty competitive but very few pros actually played on it yeah, but I guess it's still pretty good <laughs> and um, yeah. yeah I was actually going to join uh, lag which I played for an SC2 they're actually a top Warcraft team so I was going to join them, but then the game kind of died and SC2 came up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we just transitioned over to SC2. Yeah, that's fair. What handle did you actually go by? Um, I went by a few. I name changed a lot. 
<laughs> um, but I think the ones I can remember the most is probably, or the one is Trixie. Like okay. R X Y. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the one that you hit uh, number one with? Uh, no, one that I hit number one with was really, like, childish name, kind of. It was just, like, called Scars with a Z. <laughs> so it's little, yeah. Uh, fair enough, man. I mean, some people have to live with the names they've uh, chosen. I, I, I will tell you, I did not come up with a Fear Dragon at the age of, like, 22 or 23. <laughs> but yeah, that's cool. So, I mean, you, you made that transition out from uh, Warcraft 3 to Starcraft 2 when the game came out then because of lag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you've been playing since Wings of Liberty beta, and how have you been feeling about StarCraft like since between Wings of Liberty and Haunts? Um, I think Protoss in general hasn't like, especially in Wings, even more so. Like, there is never really any consistent player. Like, even if the race was doing well, mm -hmm. something I really dislike, and like that's why I'd probably choose Zerg or Terran if I was to start over again, is because. <laughs> If you look at, like, the races, they're all pretty balanced, and Protoss isn't weak or anything. But <laughs> there's not many consistent Protoss players. It's only, like, maybe Rain. And the big factor is because PvP is, like, the most, like, coin flippy kind of matchup. Like, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the way that it kind of works is in a high level, if one pro gets a build advantage, he knows exactly how to, like use his advantage and usually it's some sort of timing mm -hmm. that kills the other Protoss so at that level when they're both like super good um, the player who gets a build order advantage will win like 90% of the time huh that's really interesting um, I know there have been a lot of different takes on like PvP and stuff um, but yeah that's totally fair we'll get a little bit more into that kind of stuff into the when we start talking about gameplay um, but I also want to ask you a little bit more about um, I guess your whole situation because I know that you said you're taking a year off from school. Um, is that are you taking a year off from high school or uh, college? You just graduate high school and you're taking I just time off. I graduated from high school. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And you're just playing StarCraft full time then? Um, I work a bit, mm -hmm. but other than that, yeah, pretty much. But I'm kind of lazy, so I don't play as much as I should. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Where are you working right now? Uh, I just work at a grocery store called No Frills. <laughs> oh, that's totally fair. Um, and, I mean, how much time would you say you get to actually spend on StarCraft then? Um, how much do I spend or could I spend? That's like... We'll go with could, and then we'll talk about how much do you spend later. <laughs> okay, I could probably spend at least maybe like six to eight hours a day. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, and do your parent? are you, like, living at home with your parents or anything? Do they know at all about your involvement in esports? Uh, yeah, they do. Yeah, um, what do they think about it? So, at first, like, when I was playing Warcraft a lot, they were really against it, but mm -hmm. since I've been doing this for, like, years now, they're a lot more supportive. And, like, after lands, when I bring money home and stuff, even though it's not that much, they're still pretty <laughs> happy about it, so... Yeah, they're okay with it. Yeah, cool. And especially, like, I mean, uh, how do they feel about you taking time off from, say, uh, I think you, the way that you phrased it was you were taking t a year off from school. So it sounds like you do intend to go to college at some point. Um, how do they feel about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, they're okay with it. Like, my marks are decent enough so I can go to university. Mm -hmm. And obviously university, there's a bunch of different, like, things you can take some take like maybe three years to graduate some take like six mm -hmm. whatever yeah so they're like okay with it because i mean lots of people like go back to college and university and stuff whenever they want so taking a year off isn't really that much of a big deal in my opinion yeah that's yeah i think that's actually something i've seen a lot of players uh, especially try to do um they if you're going to make it work they do it after high school so you still have some education yeah and then you, it's a pretty natural gap where you're making that transition so makes sense but uh, yeah let's kind of move on to more current events and uh you know now i i have to bring it up because it's something that has been talked about a lot um you do have a bit of a reputation that you've kind of built up in the starcraft community uh to say the least you've, you've kind of rubbed a lot of people the wrong way so could you tell us like why do people 
had this sort of interpretation of you? Um, especially before, like, I got really mad at the game when I lost. Um, mm -hmm. These days, I don't DM that much, but only if it's, like, a certain player, because there actually are lots of players in North American GM ladder that will actually, like, trash talk and stuff on, like, different aliases or life. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, they just pretty much talk crap when they win. And then it's just, like, I'm the only one... Well, not only me, but, I mean, a handful of us get, like, known for it. But there's actually many more people that actually do it, but they just don't do it on their main accounts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Is it... Are you really only doing this to, like, the people who are actually trash-talking, then? For um, the most part? Yeah, right now, at least, yeah. But before, um, I used to actually get really mad at the game, which is why I took a few months off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, what kind of change that uh, prompted, I guess, the way that you handle it? Uh, I took some time off. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, what was that? Uh, about, like, maybe six, seven months ago. I see. Uh, what kind of prompted that? Um, prompted the break? Yeah. Oh, I was just getting, like, too frustrated with the game. Oh, got it. Yeah. But, I mean, was it, like, an intentional, I'm going to come back eventually kind of thing? Or more of a, I, I'm really frustrated, you eventually did end up coming back? Yeah. Actually, I was getting quite good at League of Legends. That's what I was oh, really? Doing. Yeah. But I just didn't really like it because it was a team game. And mm -hmm. lots of team games where I, like, you can only practice and do your best so much. But if you're a team doesn't want to like practice and train as hard as you then it doesn't matter how hard you play so that's why i didn't like it i'd much rather just like rely on yourself and if you lose there's always stuff you can like improve on and the best part is like you know if you put the time and dedication into it you can do it mm -hmm. but with mobas um if a, even one player on the team isn't dedicated enough uh the whole team could lose because of it so yeah, that's, that's a pretty fair criticism, and uh, I know that's a reason why a lot of people don't like in, or enjoy League of Legends as much. Um, I guess going back to uh, a little bit more of your involvement in StarCraft again, um, there was a point actually where you changed your name from uh, Believe to Naya, and what actually caused that? Um, so my favorite StarCraft 1 pro gamer was Nada, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you know of. Yeah. So Actually, Naya and Nada mean the same thing in Korean. <laughs> I see. Well, yeah. why did why did you change your name though? Because I know that one criticism a lot of people get is that when you change your name, you lose a lot of your branding as a player. Like a lot of the recognition you may have gotten, kind of disappears, right? Um. Yeah, but I mean, like you see Koreans and stuff, and they change mm -hmm. it a lot of the time. But the thing is, I'm not as well known as Koreans are. Like, mm -hmm. the only people that would know me are probably people from NA. So, mm -hmm. it didn't matter that much. And I really liked the name, so <laughs> I changed it. Okay, that's fair. Um, but yeah, I guess moving on, um, what kind of, uh, I guess, in involvement in StarCraft Two would you say has been, like, your biggest achievement? Um, so it could be, like, a tournament win, it could be, I don't know, any kind of general work that you've done in StarCraft, maybe just even being for an, there for an event or something? What's been your biggest achievement? I won a land only one time, though, because in Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, there's really, like, a lot of good SC2 players. So mm -hmm. lots of the time, like, at most tournaments, I'd say it's me, Massa, and Hendralis, and we all, like, revolve around top three. Usually Massa wins, though. So. <laughs> that's is pretty good, man. Um, okay, that's that's cool. Well, what was the one tournament that you won? Um, like what was it called? It was the yeah. land that was in Toronto. Uh huh. Was that, was that like a card shop? But I can't remember. Oh, Untouchables. That's what. Untouchables. Called. Yeah. That's cool. And I I know that you like attended like LAN ETS and stuff. I know that there are a lot of really good players there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, cool. So 
you're obviously an up and coming player in the North American scene. I know that you obviously play the ladder a lot. You qualified with the number one, uh, the highest spot, I should say, uh, of the players applying for breaking out. So you qualify with that first ladder spot. Um, what kind of difficulties have you faced uh, trying to break out into the scene? Um, there's a few, and I think most of them, almost every NA player has. So the biggest one is WCS is like by far the biggest tournament that there is. Mm-hmm. So when I was coming back to SC2, it was actually when the first WCS qualifier was. Like the first WCS qualifier for 2014 was about a week or two away when I came back. So I didn't like I wasn't well practiced, so I only tried out once, but I made it to the last round and then I lost. Um so yeah, I just wasn't very well practiced. And then if you're somebody who doesn't make it into WCS, you have to mm-hmm. wait another, I think it's about four months. Yeah, that. something like that. Yeah, to play again. And I mean, other than that, there's no, or not no, but there's very little NA content that gets good for ship. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, and I guess my follow-up question to that is, uh, I mean, beyond obviously trying to qualify for WCS when you can, what kinds of things have you been doing to try and give yourself more visibility or exposure or just keep yourself busy, I should say? Um, I'm kind of the player. I, I don't stream a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I just try to work really hard when I practice. And, like, I don't try to waste time. I always try to, like, look at replays of, like, Koreans playing. And mm-hmm. then I just might ask, like, a teammate or something oh, hey, can you practice with me? And then I'll try the build maybe like five or ten times in a row. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I, guess I just work hard, and I don't really like to stream. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Um, and where do you see yourself skill-wise uh, in terms of, you know, as being an up-and-coming player? Because I know that you have mentioned uh, playing against some pretty good players. Yeah, um... Well, in terms of my play right now, um, it's not doing that great because I haven't been practicing very hard lately. <laughs> but about a month ago, before ETS, I was actually doing really well. Mm-hmm. And then ever since the pa- patch, I feel like I lost the motivation to play. Oh, man. Yeah. Because with the new patch, TDP is really hard to play right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that's pretty fair. I know the Mothership Core plus the Widow Mine, uh, Mothership Core nerf, Widow Mine buff. Yeah, I mean like, the Mothership was a pretty needed nerf. Like mm-hmm. maybe they should have made it from fourteen to like eleven or something. Nine might have been a bit too drastic, but it's okay. It was mostly the mine thing because with the mines it forces you to go into Colossus play. Mm-hmm. They can kind of meta game around that because they know you can't go Templars or else. Oh, it's here. Yeah. Bio mine can just kill it. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can understand how that would be pretty frustrating. Um, but I mean, you mentioned that you you're saying like you're having a little bit of trouble finding motivation to play. What does your normal day look like? Uh, I guess in one instance when you have motivation to play, and another when you don't. Um, honestly, my days I don't have like a set time. I just kind of play when I feel like it, or like when something comes up, I'll stop play. But um. I can play for, like, a very long time. Like, there's been days where I can play, like, 10 or 12 hours with, like, minimal breaks. Mm -hmm. But then there's other days where I might play, like, half an hour or an hour. So (laughs) it's, like, very... What's the word? High variance. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, What would you say is more of, like, the average or the norm, I I should ask? Because I know one of the questions I promised I would ask is how much can you play versus how much do you play yeah um normally i could probably i think i could play about like six to ten hours Mm -hmm. um but i choose to play or anywhere in between i'd say on weekdays it's about like four Mm -hmm. four ish and then on saturday and sunday if there's no tournament or anything i'll probably play around like six to eight Mm -hmm. okay and one of the other things that you mentioned was kind of playing with teammates and stuff. And I have to ask, we have the core gaming logo with you on the screen and everything, but I, I, it's my understanding that you're not quite on core gaming. But tell, tell us a little bit more about your team situation right now. Um, 
really hard to explain right now. <laughs> right now there are like lots of things going on some of which i don't know some of which i can't really say so uh yeah there's nothing i can really say about it right now okay um are you still on core gaming um right now i'm not on core gaming okay um and are you on any other team um yeah actually for now though um i'm on I don't even know how to say it. it's like Prometheus gaming. Prometheus? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can I ask like what prompted you to join this team? Um, or like, well, I guess if you can't talk too much about why you're not on core gaming, um, can you tell us a little bit about Prometheus gaming? Um, it's quite big, but it's more of a community team other than mm -hmm. me and maybe like a few other members. Um, the management is really friendly, and other than that, I mean, right now, in NA, it's very hard to find a team that'll give you salary, like, there's very few. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, I guess I should re-say that. If you're in WCS, I think it's a lot easier to get more benefits from a team mm -hmm. than if you're not. So, since I'm not right now, um... Yeah, it's just better to go with them than to go with, like, a more known team that will probably won't give you any, <laughs> except, like, obviously their tag and stuff, which, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's totally fair. And you mentioned, like, practice partners. Could you actually name some, uh, some of your practice partners or, like, people that you get to play games with and stuff? Uh, yeah. So I practice with, from my, from core at least, I practice mm -hmm. with mainly... Um, John Snow is my main practice with uh, Zer, <laughs> and yeah, <coughs> um, Kelizer. He's probably my main practice with Taren, and mm -hmm. I was helping EJK. Is he the him. Brazilian player? Yeah, yeah. Kelizer, yeah. yeah. And uh, I was practicing with Evan, but uh -huh. that was more like me helping him and stomping him every game. <laughs> so, you know, if we count that as practice. Um, oh man. <laughs> There's a few. There's um, Suppy, QXC. Um, I used to play a lot with uh, APOC when he was in NA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he's in Korea now, so we don't play much because of the latency. Wow, okay. Yeah. Um, Blue Ices, he's like a top 50 GM Zerg. He uses a barcode. Mm -hmm. um, Need. Yeah, yeah. That I can think a of. A lot of really, really good players. Um... So mostly like ladder games or like custom games or um with them customs. Um like for example Neep, he doesn't play NA at all. Mm -hmm. He's actually top ten grandmaster on Euro. <laughs> but he doesn't play any NA. Well, that's that's really impressive though. Uh you're getting to like play all these games with a, a lot of these really, really well um uh, respected uh players. Like I mean Suppy especially, like Neeb, um I guess Apocalypse also for, like, Team IVD and everything. Um, that's really cool. Uh, but, yeah, I, I guess... Do you have anything else to say on the, uh, your team? I know that's a little bit ambiguous right now. Uh, no, not really. All right, uh, that's fine, then. We can actually move on to the gameplay segment. So, during the gameplay segment, I always ask uh, some really, really weird question that usually involves Dustin Browder. But today, I actually just couldn't think of anything. So, I'm just going to ask you straight up. If you actually had control of Activision Blizzard, and you could change the way that they handle either WCS or Game Balance or whatever you wanted, what would you change? Um, first thing is, um, I think David Kim does a really good job, and people do give him a lot of flack. But um, something he actually does really badly is he asks for, like, NA pro gamers and stuff, he actually asks for their thoughts on balance and stuff, which I don't think is very good, because, like, I know he asks, like, the Muslim, and, like, the Muslim's, like, pretty good, but he's still losing to, like, pretty unknown North American players, so I don't think, like, if you put a top Korean against someone like the Muslim, the Muslim would lose, like, probably 90%, I think, so I don't think asking him for, like, a balance issue, I don't think is very smart. I think 
he should probably ask the Koreans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did you say in the question, like, running WCS and stuff? Yeah, basically, and anything that Blizzard is handling. Um, well, this is kind of tricky to say, but, like, if they added more money, like, maybe not as much as League of Legends, but mm -hmm. they added more money, um, it would be, like, more people would want to get into StarCraft and try to play competitively because there's more money involved in it, but I can see from Blizzard's, like, point of view why, because, like, you can't just pour all your money into everything. Mm -hmm. Do you mean, like, more money at, like, the bottom level or the top level or just um, where? Just everywhere. I actually think Blizzard did a really good job at, like, what's the word, dividing their prize pool up. Because, mm -hmm. like, I know for Premiere, if you get into Premiere, it's, like, $2,000, which is mm -hmm. pretty good. Yeah, so I think yeah. they do a good job with that. Uh, I guess, I guess kind of on that topic, like, where would you suggest, I guess... It's kind of like the hard question to ask, but uh, where would you suggest they get the money from, I guess, is what I'm getting well, at. Well, Blizzard's, like, makes billions of dollars. Or billions <laughs> of the biggest, um, like, money makers in the gaming industry out of, like, companies, I think. Am I wrong? Huh. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I mean, well, I know that Activision... Like, the way that the companies generally work is, like, Activision will ha handle a lot of their games each... Like, game has separate departments and stuff, so they have to request funds from, like, different sections of the company. Wait. Yeah. I think it gets a little bit complicated in terms of, like, pulling money from, like, the entirety of the company. Yeah. But, yeah, that's fair. Okay. So, those are the two main things. You put more money into the WCS uh, prizing, and you would... Um. Yeah, there's also, mm -hmm. like, one other thing I would do. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't make, like, Koreans, like, live in what region they want to, but something, like, for Challenger, they made it so that there's only, like, a certain amount of spots going to, like, Koreans and, like, mm -hmm. yeah, et cetera. So I think they should do the same thing um, Premier League because mm -hmm. that way I think there would be more North American players in it. Mm -hmm. And that way... Even if you're Korean, you'd have to be, like, really good to get to um, Premier League, even WCSNA. Just because there's going to be, like, maybe 15 good Koreans fighting for, like, let's say, five, six, seven, eight spots. That's interesting. Uh, what would you... I'm actually kind of curious what your thoughts are on uh, how Blizzard should maybe, in that situation, handle the uh, transition of having so many Koreans from 2013 moving into 2014 so they they had all been in wcs america they'd all qualified and were in premier league so they were given those kind of spots uh would you just kind of say like move them to korea and they lose their spots or do they get spots into wcs korea like uh, how would you handle that i think you'd have to wait for the end of wcs 2014 and implement it into wcs 2015 okay yeah like i don't yeah. think it's very wise to do it right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, all that aside, we'll kind of go a little bit more into, I guess, your own gameplay and get your thoughts. So, I mean, we asked in your application video what you kind of described your strengths and weaknesses were as in your playstyle, and you said that you had a, a pretty standard playstyle that you kind of like to mix it in and not really keep to one kind of uh, key... <laughs> I guess, way of playing. Uh, you, one game you'll play a macro game, the next game you'll all in. So could you kind of explain that a little bit more? Um, yeah, so there's a few things. Basically, any good Protoss player, like the strength of Protoss as a race is that it has lots of, it's very flexible. Like there's mm -hmm. lots of different openers, there's lots of things it can lead to, which is why, for example, Zerg players have to keep scouting with like overseers and stuff to always see mm -hmm. what exactly um, Protoss is doing. So, a good Protoss, he'll see the map, and he'll probably pick one of the best, like, two or three options on that map. So, like, for example, Yansu, mm -hmm. it has very tight chokes at either of the third that you're gonna take as Zerg. So it's very good to do a sentry-based attack, whether it's, like, Blink Stalker sentry, or Immortal All-In. Mm -hmm. Those are probably the two best builds on that map, because the chokes are so small that it's very hard for Zerg to hold. 
-hmm. And for example, if you go macro on that map, um, it's a very good swarm host map. So if you play one style, like let's say Minigun, he's very famously known to only play macro, right? Yeah. It'll be much harder for Minigun to play Yansu if he plays macro because Nozer likes Yansu because it's a very good Protoss all in map, but it's actually a very good Zerg map in the late game. It's just it never gets to the late game. <laughs> so what I'm trying to get at is basically Protoss will look at the map and they'll decide their build on the map, but a good Protoss will be capable of doing anything from macro to all ins and anything mm -hmm. in between. Okay, so when you are looking at a map, you generally have like maybe one or two things that you generally just always do on that map then? Um, yeah, two or three. Two or but, three things? Yeah, but if it, there's actually a few maps that you could all in on, and you can macro on too, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, for man. For example, Frost, you could go for a three base attack, or you can macro, for example. And mm -hmm. actually, it depends a lot on what exactly the map does for the other race. Like, Frost is a very good Mutalisk map. Mm -hmm. So lots of Zergs will trade their army once, and then they'll go to Mutalists because they can get so many bases and just go Mutalists <laughs> corrupt. <laughs> so uh, yeah. it's, it's wise to go for a three base attack on that map, for example. Yeah, and how exactly do you decide uh, which of like the quote unquote two to three strategies uh, that you're going to do then? Um, usually, I watch GSL and stuff, so I look at mm -hmm. what the Koreans are doing on each map. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds it sounds like you put a lot of faith in I guess Korean play and um, I guess a lot of trust that they just kind of know what they're doing then, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, like in mm -hmm. pro houses in Korea, I mean they have like coaches and stuff that actually are paid to just come up with builds and stuff, and they obviously practice much harder mm -hmm. than an A and EU. So that's why you see Koreans always win because they usually have the most optimal and best builds. Mm -hmm. So I think. It's wise to copy from that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And uh, what kind of stuff are you, in particular, kind of practicing or working on? Um, I've been working on my PBZ in late game a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've been depressed from PvP PBT. Yeah. Like, I used to win about 80% of my PBTs. And now I win, like, 30%. Pretty rough. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, what was the cause of that? Because I, I think you were uh, were saying that you felt in PvP a lot of the stuff is kind of determined by your opening build orders. So. Uh, yeah, I can go into that a bit if you'd like. Yeah, um, I'd love to hear more about that. So basically, let's say we're playing on me and you, okay? We're mm -hmm. playing on Frost, right? And or let's just do a two-player map. Let's say Habitation Station. And let's say we both open up Stargate, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you, you're like, okay, this guy might go DT, so I'll go Oracle and then Phoenix to be safe, right? Mm -hmm. If I take a risk and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go Phoenixes first, mm -hmm. so you're, and you go Oracle, so you fly into my base, and then my Phoenix kills your Oracle, the game's over, because I already have pretty much a two Phoenix lead on you, mm -hmm. and your Oracle just died without doing anything you kind of understand yeah yeah that definitely makes sense um do you feel like that's true for everything like i um like uh i mean not even just where we both open up say like stargate or you have two pro players that open up stargate but robotic facility versus like blink stalker <laughs> openings or like one game or games where one player opens up with, like dark templar and the other person opens up to robo but the dark templar person gets the expansion down like what do you think about those games okay so I'll kind of go with all of the builds that you can do. Mm -hmm. So another thing, I guess, that's kind of coin flippish, is I'm playing you again, right? And <laughs> you go Stargate, but you skip the Oracle. And you're like, I'm going to go Phoenix, right? Mm -hmm. First. And I go DTs, then you're going to, at the very least, take a lot of damage, if not lose. But if you went for the Oracle, you would have been safe. Um... Blink against Robo is actually quite skill determined. Like it depends how well the player who goes Robo mm -hmm. can hold it off. But there is also a bit of luck in it because 
Um, I don't know if you watched the IM championships, but yeah. did you see the game hero one with the DT rush? And uh, it's going four game blank. It was on four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that kind of blink that SOS was going for, it's a very strong, even against Robo, because you're playing really risky. Because it'll auto lose to DT, but it's very strong against anything else. So, you could make it coin flippy, but you could add the Robo, so mm -hmm. the blink stalkers are a bit weaker, but you're more safe, if that makes sense to you. Because you're investing the 200 100 into the Robo. Mm -hmm. And then 75 gas into the Observer. Yeah, I guess that does make sense. Um, it's kind of interesting. It's, it sounds like it's it's advantages, but do you feel like those advantages should always like lead to victories? Because I see. I guess. I guess my uh, my Devil's Advocate side says um, you know there's a lot of games with great players that still end up going past like the one base player like two base play even um it goes into like the late game despite i guess uh one player opening up in an advantageous position to, so do you just feel like those are mistakes made by players um no there's actually a few reasons for it um mm -hmm. there are actually a few very good that are almost a hundred percent safe that maybe have like one counter mm -hmm. which is um dt into robo into uh, nexus mm -hmm. it's quite safe and so is two gate expand into robo get sentry first for hallucination scout um in my opinion those two are the safest and you can usually get into macro game with them um and the other thing is sometimes if one player messes up or something it can go to macro but i think if it's two of the very best players like if you watched um it was zest against i, I think it was part um rain sorry um mm -hmm. zest capitalized and so did Rain on every time one of them had an advantage, the other one won. I think there's only one macro game in that series, and it was best <laughs> in second. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is a fair point. There have been quite a few uh, very short-lived PVPs. Yeah. Um, um, lots of that actually has to do with, um, I don't know if you knew this, but in PVP, the person that plays really aggressive usually wins statistically. Hmm, I I did not actually know that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you also kind of mentioned that you were having maybe some trouble with PVT. Uh, I I think you briefly kind of touched upon why, but could you kind of elaborate on that? Uh, yeah. So there's a few reasons. Firstly, um, I used to go Colossus build every game in Wings, mm -hmm. and then Templars became really popular a few months ago. So I stopped going Colossus, and all I did was Templar openers. So I got really good at Templar openers, and then they <laughs> patched mine, so now you can't go Templar opener, because a very good Terran with good micro, um, five or six mines in their army can kill so many zealots and do so much splash damage to mm -hmm. them. And then if you're very good at dodging storms, it's almost unwinnable for Protoss, so it's not very smart to do. But um, Colossi now is pretty much the normal, because can get like behind a bit but it's it's kind of like rain he plays very defensive with colossus openers he gets a mm -hmm. little behind but if you play well you can still win but the problem is is that now it's like what taren was like a month or two ago they're complaining how they have they only have like one build that they can use which is reaper expand mm -hmm. um but after the patch now it's pretty much like that for protoss i feel unless oh, you're taking yeah. a huge risk like Blink Stalker, Seven Gate or something, they go Widow Mind Drop, you have a very low percent, like, percentage of winning the game. Mm -hmm. I'm actually really curious what you think of, like, some of the Stargate openings that a lot of the Chinese Protoss players uh, popularized a little while ago. Uh, the Phoenix? Cool. Yeah, the, the Stargate Phoenix, like, uh, lots of Phoenix to counteract Vikings and do all kinds of crazy shenanigans. Um, so I think it's very good. The top, top, top Terran um, mm -hmm. went almost every game against it. Like, if you saw Tasia against Jim, this was a while ago. Mm -hmm. Tasia just, like, rolled him over. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Oh, man. I, I think I did watch that game, but I think it was a while ago, so I don't really yeah. remember it too well. Um, but, um, I, guess, I guess, why is that? It's because Phoenixes 
Mm -hmm. Since you're getting so many, it's basically to block, like, or not block, but it's to kill Vikings. Mm -hmm. So your Colossi don't get touched. But if Terran hits a certain timing with double starport Viking, um, what they do is they basically have a big bio army, and you have a very small army because you're making tons of Phoenix mm -hmm. getting ups and Colossus. So your army is very small. So what they'll do is they'll take the Vikings and they'll aim the Colossi with them. Mm -hmm. And then they'll basically kill everything else with the uh, um, bio, and all you have left is like Phoenix against tons of like Marine Marauder. Hmm. And, yeah. I see. So basically, just making so many Vikings that the Phoenix can't really kill them off in time to before the Vikings kill off the Colossus. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, did you have any other kind of thoughts about the, I guess, like gameplay or like balance or? The matchups that you want to kind of talk about? Um, yeah, I actually think PBT is the most skillful matchup for Protoss. Mm -hmm. But I think um, it's very hard, but I think at the top level, especially in the late game, it's the better player usually wins, like better control and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, and in my opinion, it's the funnest to play. <laughs> it's, it's actually my favorite matchup, uh, despite all the complaints that it gets and everything. Still my favorite matchup to play and watch. So I'm with you there, man. Um, but yeah, so I did want to also ask, like, do you consider yourself to have any rivals, um, either friendly or maybe on less friendly terms? Rivals? Uh-huh. No, not really. Not like anyone I can think of. Maybe actually, maybe Hendrilis. We always play at lands. Always. <laughs> always. Oh, man. That's got to be rough. I know that Hendulus is also one of like those Canadian players that just constantly is making it up against. It's always like Hendulus and Masa, like the semifinals, or, like the finals and stuff, right? Yeah. Oh man, that's a pretty tough bracket to run into. Um, but hey, maybe you'll get to play Hendulus again in the Break Invitational. That'll be good. I'll be happy with that. <laughs> All right, but uh, we're going to move on to our final topic, which is going to be a little bit more about the future, um, your future aspirations, etc. in StarCraft. So I do want to ask, what is your aspiration in StarCraft? Is it just, do you want to get into WCS Challenger League? Do you want to get into Premier League? Um, are you taking a year off of school? So what are you looking to achieve in that year? Um, it really depends how much I put into it. Like, right now, I haven't been playing very much, so my expectation of how good I'll do is lower. But there are like some months where I'm really motivated and I'll play a lot and I think I can do really well as long as if I like kept that motivation up, I think I can do really well. Um, definitely get into WCS, but I don't know about Premier, but for sure Challenger, I can right now, I think. Mm -hmm. Um what I'd want, like, it would obviously be great to get into Premier League and get to play um, offline in around 16. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, like, I think everyone when they get there, I think you need at least a few tournaments to get used to the setting. Like, I don't think there's been a player who's played in the booth for, like, the first time and performed at his best in one. <laughs> no, no WCS America Royal Rotors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I think I have a hard time thinking of any as well. Yeah, but um, the thing is, Royal Road, or don't be fooled, because that's only their first time in Code S. Many of them have played in Code A qualifiers and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, GSL is a whole different ballgame than in terms of, like, Challenger League and qualifiers and everything. Yeah. All right. Um. So, I mean, normally I do also ask uh, players, like, would they ever consider going full time into pro gaming? Um, but you kind of are mostly full time in uh, pro gaming, so I guess I'll ask: like, would you ever consider staying for longer than just a year? Um, um if I did really well, yeah. <laughs> what would you consider really well? Like getting into this WCS Challenger League? No, <laughs> maybe um top sixteen premier in this year. Then maybe I'd <laughs> think about it because that at least like as long as it shows like good progress i'd be happy mm -hmm. okay yeah and uh i mean you've obviously shown that you have good games you say that you get to practice with a lot of really fantastic players like suppy and 
a bunch of other players that you uh, mentioned. Why don't more people know about you? I mean, you've clearly shown that you have like a pretty good degree of skill, even just getting to where you have on the North American ladder. Um, I don't think many people know of almost any North Americans, um, just because of the way WCS is obviously the biggest tournament, like I said. Mm -hmm. And there's not many North Americans in WCS Premier. Mm -hmm. So that because of that, it makes it very hard, especially because most North Americans aren't playing full time. And most of the Koreans in WCSNA are practicing like 12 hours a day in a pro house. Mm -hmm. So unless that foreigner is very gifted and can win, it's very unlikely. Mm -hmm. So that's why you only hear about a few top NA players, in my opinion. Yeah, I guess that does make sense. Um... And I guess moving on to my next question, uh, again, you have you have built up a bit of a reputation in uh, the StarCraft community. I know that you've maybe, again, rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. In the future, do you have like plans to try and make amends with those people? Or uh, I know that you've already said that you've kind of been changing the way that you treat people uh, in your games and stuff. You really only BM them um, when they've, I guess, been BM to you. But... Do you have any like intent or any fear that's gonna like haunt you in the future? Um, no, and what you're saying before, um, I've actually apologized to a lot of players mm -hmm. that I like, just BM when I was angry and they actually didn't do very much. Like for example, uh Bales. Mm -hmm. I BM'd him quite a few times and then I apologized to him and a lot of other players, but probably to like players that most people watching this wouldn't know, so <laughs> I don't really wanna think of all the list of them yeah yeah okay that's fair and uh you know where do you see yourself in two years ideally um so after your one year kind of leases up on uh your involvement in going pro in starcraft um either if i do well playing mc2 or if mm -hmm. i Do you know what you want to pursue in school? Uh, probably law. Law? Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, that actually is my final question, so that's actually going to leave us open to shout-outs or anything. Is there anyone that you want to give a shout-out to? Um, yeah, shout-out to all the people that practice with me. Um, Core Gaming and my new team also, Comethys Gaming like to thank all of them and um all the people especially ejk who's a role <laughs> model to me yeah so i want to thank him the most <laughs> and i want to thank you for hosting this tournament too oh well thank you it's an honor to have you on naya but uh yeah with that being said guys be sure to check out naya i'll toss all the links out over in the twitch chat if you're watching this over on twitch.tv slash feardragon64, if you're watching this on youtube.com slash feardragon64, all the links are just down below the video. And of course, if you did enjoy the show, please consider following the channel over on Twitch or over on YouTube or both if you feel so inclined. And uh, yeah, we are going to be doing the game day tomorrow with uh, Core Gaming Naya, or sorry, not Core Gaming Naya, Prometheus Naya. I... We'll get clarification on that. It'll be in the title, guys. Don't worry. All right, just look at the title. That's that's the team he's on. Um, but we'll be doing the game. So we'll be covering his PvZ, PvT, and PvP matchups in singular games. So you get a feel for his play style in those matchups. And uh, then we'll be doing the awesome game on Saturday alongside the arcade segment and the replay analysis if you want to learn a little bit about the games that uh, Naya submitted. So... Hopefully you guys will enjoy that and tune in for that at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. And that is going to be it. So guys, thank you so much for tuning in on this wonderful Thursday night. Hope to see you guys all tomorrow. Take care.